Bueno, sí. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Spain Pavilion this wonderful Saturday. Um, today is the day of energy and mobility in this pavilion. We will have many events related with that. So we consider that this extraordinary good news to begin with something so inspiring as an event on art and sustainability. So we want to thank, first of all, EEA, IE, sorry, <laughs> for uh, helping us to, to organize and proposing to have this event. And of course, Francesca Tissenborn-Misa for coming here. And I would like to give the floor now to Catalina to introduce the speakers and to begin with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. It is an honor today for our university to be co-hosting this panel together with Thyssen Bornemisa Art Contemporary. Our university is committed to sustainability and is supporting the Spanish government as Entidad Solidaria of COP25. The complex challenge of sustainability can only be addressed if it is tackled from different disciplines and we bring to the table different points of view. Today we're going to dig into the relationship between our sustainability and climate change. Please let me introduce our fabulous speakers. Francesca thyssen bornemisza is a founder and chairwoman of thyssen bornemisza Art Contemporary TBA 21. She's an activist, philanthropist, and patron of the arts. Driven by a belief in the power of art to serve as an agent of change, she has supported artists throughout her career in the production and creation of new work that fuels engagement with most pressing issues of our times. Since 2002, TBA 21 has built an unparalleled collection of contemporary art under Thyssen Bornemisza's uh, leadership, including more than 100 commissions by artists such as Olafur Eliasson, Amar Kanwar, Ernesto Neto, or John Gerard. John Gerard is responsible for the breathtaking piece that is in display in the courtyard of Museo Nacional Thyssen Bornemisza in this very moment. For the work, Gerard has recreated the landscape around Lucas, Lucas Gusher, the world's first major oil find in Spindletop, Texas, discovered in 1901 and now barren and exhausted. This historical site has been reconstructed in a digital simulation animated by a game engine. Our second speaker, Marcus Raymond, is a director, TBA 21 Academy, which fosters interdisciplinary dialogue and exchange surrounding the most urgent ecological, social, and economic issues facing our oceans today. Raymond leads the nonprofit engagement with artists, activists, scientists, and policymakers worldwide, resulting in the creation of new commissions, new bodies of knowledge and new policies advancing the conservation and protection of the oceans. In March 2019, TBA 21 Academy launched Ocean Space, a new global port for ocean literacy, research, and advocacy. Located in the restored church of San Lorenzo in Venice, Italy, Ocean Space will be activated by the Itinerant Academy and its network of partners, including universities, NGOs, museums, government agencies, and research institutes from around the world. And our third panelist, Jose Luis de Vicente. Jose Luis is a curator, writer, and cultural researcher working in the space between art, design, science, and innovation. He's the head curator of Sonar Plus D, the Digital Culture Congress of Sonar Festival in Barcelona, and co-director of Tentacular, a festival of critical technologies and digital adventures in Matadero in Madrid. As curator, he conceives and develops anti-disciplinary anti exhibitions that explore emerging social and political scenarios, creating context for the collaboration and dialogue between artists, designers, technologists, scientists, activists, policymakers, policy and community groups. In, in 2018, he curated the exhibition After the End of the World at CCCB Barcelona a group shown about future scenarios in the world after the Paris Agreement. Recently, he curated 
the immersive AFMR environment atmospheric memory by artist Rafael Lozano Hemmer on the transformation of the atmosphere in the last 150 years. Manchester Science and Industry Museum. His next exhibition, curated by Rosa Pera, reevaluates the legacy of legendary thinker, designer, and architecture, Buckminster Fuller, one of the first figures in the world of culture that anticipated the current planetary crisis. We are very much looking forward to listening to the insights of our fantastic panelists on the relationship between art sustainability and climate change on the power of art as an agent of change, and on the sustainability challenge that the art sector itself is facing. Please, the, word, the floor is yours. Catalina, thank you so much. Um, it's been really a pleasure collaborating with IE. Really, it's a great university. We enjoyed our talk there very much the other day. Thank you. With John. It was incredible. Speaking to the students of that university was, got us very emotional, actually. So yes. let's see if we can all get emotional today about these topics. Just to change a little bit from all the other talks that I've been attending at least. Um, so here's a different perspective. Here's a perspective about how does art possibly play a role in this? Because we all agree that we're all in this together, that um, what is going on in these well, amongst these walls is possibly not enough. Um, what I saw in the street yesterday was way more than I've seen in here for the last few days. I'm really sorry to say that. Not in this pavilion, but in general. I thought, I felt that there was a power of expression and of emotion from the people, and there was a lot of cultural, it was like a carnival nearly. It was amazing, that, that demonstration of 500,000 people. So I was just thinking how to put it to you, what, what the background of what we want to talk about, um, which is from the cultural perspective and the cultural domain, how can we three as practitioners contribute to this issue? How can we articulate better and in a different way and hope to uh, create some sort of empathy because there's a lot of information, there is a tremendous amount of data that we are having to process in order to understand what these changes really mean and how they're coming about and what we can do about them and what the possible solutions might be. But I'm missing this empathy, I'm missing the relationship, I'm missing when we go out into the field what that experience really is and why to do, to really want to make a difference so i thought i'd just go back a little bit and then go start off with the background of the foundation just to show you a few projects that don't necessarily relate to the environment but just to try and demonstrate how in fact they moved mountains at the time when they were done in terms of communicating a particular issue and this first slide was, is a shot of the Budapest Parliament um, in 2006. This was just the year before the enlargement of the EU embracing seven new nations in the, into, from the Eastern Bloc. And a Turkish artist called Kutluk Ataman had in, uh, invited us to, to commission a piece which was the lives of 30 Kurdish villages on a village outside of Istanbul that was being eaten up as this huge city expanded and they were informed that they were no longer allowed to teach their children anything in their own language so they were getting absorbed into Turkish culture and you know that this Kurdish and Turkish um, conflict goes on for centuries and so just to show you Looking at this image now, you know, sort of 15 years later, I'm thinking to myself, how amazing that we brought Kurdish refugees in a form of an art project right here in front of the Budapest Parliament, which all those years ago seemed really relevant. But today, it's even more relevant given the politics of Hungary. Um, and so on this barge, we installed these video um, of all these people and each one of them spoke about their life. 
And guess what? As weird as their language sounded, and as odd in those days as a headscarf seemed to us, every single one of these people had their lives, I mean, it was transcribed uh, on the screen. They talked about things that you and I really wanted. They wanted to have a good life for their children. They wanted to have a decent sex life. They wanted to have, um, they wanted to be able to travel. I mean, the, the dreams of those people, they wanted to have incredible family and tight. They wanted their identities. They wanted to be who they are. They wanted to have the right to learn their language. And all of this is stuff that I and everybody who looked at this piece totally related to. So all of a sudden, the prejudice against people that looked so and sound completely unfamiliar, felt very, very familiar. Um, so this traveled through seven countries of the Eastern Bloc, and each one of those countries we actually discussed, you know, this sense of identity and identities changing as they become members of the European Union. This is another project by an Indian artist called Amar Kanwar. This is a very environmental project where he traveled to a county of Orissa where the worst mining and coal burning in India is present. About one third of that country is uninhabitable because of that county and it's a huge county in India department. And all of the people that lived in these territories, including indigenous people, have been moved off their land. And there have been many, many struggles by people to maintain their land and stay there. I won't go into such detail of every project, but these, this was called a question of evidence. And we, he collected over years the evidence of these crimes and put them into an artwork. And then we brought this artwork back to the capital of Orissa. And it became the center point where all the people that have struggled with this issue were able to come and deposit more evidence because at the end of the day whatever happens to people that are not even registered I mean their their claim on the land their actual documents somehow ended up as part of this art piece um, I'm going to race forward to the Amazon there was an amazing presence of Amazonian Indians in the demonstration yesterday um, we traveled if, Two years ago, I think it was, no, four years ago, we traveled up to the very early, it's very near the border of Peru. It's the land of the Uniquin, and the Uniquin um, are in these reserves, which are, of course, protected um, by the, what used to be protected. And um, we went there with a very famous Brazilian artist called Ernesto Neto. And Ernesto Neto, um, wanted to invite them to be part of an exhibition that we had commissioned him to do in Vienna, Austria. So we went up to the villages and they called all the shamans from all around and all the neighboring villages. 31 of them came. And during an Arawashka ceremony, they asked the gods if this was okay for them to travel to Europe because there's a lot of taboo involved in indigenous people leaving their country. But more and more you realize that they really need to come and they need to come to COP and they need to be heard and they need to say, stop destroying our livelihood. And these are some of the drawings that then they produced as artists that were included in this exhibition. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Ernesto Neto, but he's an extraordinary artist. And you see these sort of very globe, global sensual um, um, elements that he created. And in the bottom slide, you can see that he actually built what is called the Kupishawa, which is actually the the, the, the meeting house of the village and he created one out of net and he's weaving it with the women that he works with in Brazil so it's also using recycled materials and creating these incredible sculptures working with lo local communities so Ernesto is super very much engaged in working with communities as you can see um, and one other artist that is maybe more famous to people at COP is, um, is uh, Rolifer Eliasson. Um, he did this famous ice watch outside of COP21 where he, I mean, we're both gonna talk about that as well. But this was a project where we did a workshop over to create these incredible light sculptures made out of individual lamps. They were green, 
because they symbolize the green light that many people hung outside their windows when all of the migrants started arriving about three or four years ago from Syria and all of the war refugees and migrants that arrived en masse in Europe with Angela Merkel holding her arms open and saying, come to us. And the green light symbolized that exact thing of you are welcome to our communities. But how to integrate, how to work, they were being put into very confined spaces, not allowed out. So we decided to do this workshop. These are a group of Syrian women together with, uh, there was some Afghani young men, teenagers, there were also people that were too young to be considered um, uh, refugees. And um, so these groups of people were invited to learn how to use this lamp to create this lamp and it was built and then sold in order to create funds for them to be able to sort of invest and support the, the homes in which they were living in to give them a better quality of life. But more importantly was the shared learning program. The shared learning program had a lot to do with all the artist community that we know and recognize and work with us would come and do workshops with them. Apart from us teaching them German so that they could integrate, they were taught a lot about our contemporary culture, which actually was extremely well received. And it is a testimony of how contemporary art and culture may not seem so totally weird and foreign to people. And um, these were extraordinary. We had then invited to the Venice Biennial, Central Italian Pavilion, where we then worked with refugees and migrants that were in Italy. Um, that was slightly more problematic because, of course, Venice doesn't have any immigrants. They're not allowed to be. So we had to literally bring them in from Trieste. But this was the kind of atmosphere that we tried to create with them. Um, uh, this is another work by a Lebanese artist called Walid Rad, under the, goes under the name of um, uh, Atlas Group, sorry. And he actually described a lot of the war um, in the last 20 years in Lebanon. And um, these are images that he created where you see these dots on the different parts of the da uh, destroyed landscape from the war. Each dot, each color represents that this piece of arsenal actually comes from which country. So they're color coded. And it just sort of image of that tree in the middle of this destroyed area with so many colors on it, which means so many different sides were shooting from bullets coming from so many different countries. And it's this image of Lebanon always having been this territory where war happened, but it wasn't their war, it was somebody else's war. So here is the ice watch. I'm going to stop talking about that because um, Jose Luis wants to talk to you about this project. But another person that did an incredible amount of work in Spain is Alan Sekula. And he actually documented the black, uh, the big Exxon tanker that, that um, crashed outside of Galicia. And there was this black tide. And an amazing artist who's no longer alive, but a legend and somebody who actually moved this envelope of artists being able to embrace these subjects and these topics, these urgencies, and visualize them through their own language, which is different from documentaries, television, and news media. Um, and I'm coming to my last slide, oops, um, which is the famous Western flag, which is now become the, the, art, the creative or the art icon of climate injustice during this conference. It's actually exhibited at the Tissan Bornemisza Museum in Madrid. And we were talking yesterday that all the cultural institutions in this country and the city have been asked to contribute. And I have to say, IE and Tissan are about the only ones who've actually lifted their hands and said, we will do something. And in literally two weeks, we put up this monumental work. And what it represents is actually the first oil strike in Texas, in Spindletop, in 1901. And actually, this pipe is still standing. It has a little gift shop and visitor center attached to it, which you don't see in the artwork. But what this symbolized was this oil gusher 
was the beginning of the oil rush, which was the beginning of the industrial age, which was the thing that changed everything from agriculture to transport to the way we live, to the building of cities. If you think before that, people were going around in horse-driven carts now and ever since they've been able to drive cars. And these are the things that really have impacting us. We all know that carbon dioxide is invisible. I'm actually producing carbon dioxide here right in front of you. So there's no visual carbon dioxide, but this image of this black smoke, which is in real time used gaming technology to create this image of this flag, which looks very much like the American flag, which are, we are holding responsible for this climate disaster because they triggered off the oil rush. So if you were to put bookends to the beginning and the end of the climate change crisis, this would be the symbol of the first bookend. And we hope that the second bookend would be taken at this conference in COP, when nations come together to decide once and for all to leave the oil in the ground. Wouldn't that be a marvelous decision? if we could only convince our ministers of environment to take that fundamental decision and slow down and stop these emissions. So this is what I felt there was a strong image and great artwork to bring this point home during this COP conference. I'm sorry if I've talked too long, but we're going to move over to Marcus <laughs> Raymond. <laughs> Thank you. So Mark, yes. can I just say that TBA21 has supported the Academy of Marcus Raymond for now about nine, uh, seven years. And nine, nearly nine years. Nine years. Yeah. Really bad nine years. mistakes. No. No. Um, because I'm passionate about the oceans and together we realized that the oceans were something that could really benefit from having this artistic interpretation. So it's been an offshoot of the foundation. It's now running off and really becoming an international organization on its own because it's really much bigger than any cultural foundation can handle because this is really about issues that are so much bigger than us. So I congratulate you on this independent move and I um, you know, want you to introduce the ac academy if you can. Um, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you very much, Catalina, uh, for for having me and us. Um, it's ironic that you say it would be so ideal if the countries would come together and take this decision. And then I look out and I see Great Britain, who is voting in next week about um, you know, where they want to go and if they want to go alone and if they're going to turn into three or more, we don't know. But it would be nice if countries would come together to take this decision, because I do think it is, it is a collective effort. Yeah. Um, and as you said before, uh, the energy on the street and the collectivity on the street uh, is, is, pretty, um, is pretty obvious. Uh, and then the question is, how does this translate into political will? will? And I think this is really also the question for me and for us at the Academy, how can we generate this and why is it important to include artists in, in this and not just include them at the, end of the, at, the, uh, at the end of the line and have art and culture as a kind of ornamentation. Or ladies program. Or ladies program. Mm -hmm. But have it at the center and maybe through having artistic thinking, artistic practice and artistic research or knowledge creation uh, through artwork also as a possibility of imagining different ways forward, imagining other futures um, and collaborating on a different way. So my presentation is in form of a PDF which is rather in this day and age unsexy. So what I'm going to do and it doesn't scroll very well either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this one up and I'm going to leave it here. I because can solve it. No, 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 this is fine. Um, because in 2011 we were very lucky to uh, be able to launch a program from within TBA 21 which we then called the Academy and the main content provider of this program was and uh, still is this boat. 
Uh, this boat is the Dardanella. The Dardanella is a 39 meter explorer vessel. And in 2011, we took the decision to start a program to explore the oceans through the lens of art, with artists, with the help of artists, but um, to give them as much information and help as possible, we started curating expeditions on this boat. Um, and we invited scientists, environmentalists, lawyers, later on indigenous leadership, to have as many entry points in these topics as possible. Um, and what we rea uh, rel uh, realized relatively quickly was that Although we prepared quite substantially, we didn't know anything about the oceans. And this was not just us as an organization or me as an individual or as a practitioner, but it was also us as a species. And um, the marine biologists and oceanographers were actually quite open and frank about it, that they knew very little about the ocean, which is quite surprising coming out of the mouth of a scientist. So. Uh, coming out of the organization that Francesca has uh, very eloquently described with a number of exemplary, uh, exemplary uh, um, uh, projects, uh, we were very lucky that we were able to say we're not going to produce art immediately. We had the time to look into the topics that we thought are necessary to understand when we're looking in and at the ocean uh, and so we, got, we took time to understand science, we took time to understand conservation, we initiated three conservation projects ourselves, are still running one in Jamaica, uh, which is now a six square kilometer marine protected area, run by a sister organization which we created in, and uh, connected back to our practice through an artist in res residency program. Whilst we were in Jamaica, we found this tiny little organization tucked away neatly in the harbor of Kingston, which is the International Seabed Authority, which is a United Nations agency uh, tasked with the administration and distribution of the resources on the seabed. Uh, this is an environmental disaster waiting to happen. It's currently being formulated how we want, how big we want this disaster to be. But uh, the driving uh, agents in that organization definitely want this environmental disaster to happen. Uh, the environmental disaster is deep sea mining and uh, so to understand what art could do or the language of culture could do in this kind of framework which we always understand uh, as set and rigorous and completely inflexible the question is what happens if we release kind of a an organism like culture into this framework and what happens if this framework accepts us and so we applied to become an observer at the International Seabed Authority. We're now the only art organization currently that have been granted this observer status. Um, and now we're invited with the United States, who haven't uh, signed the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Seas, as long, along with uh, Greenpeace, WWF, and all of them, to observe what is happening in the annual meetings there. And only after that, uh, and after taking time to thoroughly understand research, uh, we started creating art. What we realized um, in working with artists and putting art and artists at the center of this process was that they have a fabulous capacity of bringing people together around the table, being non-discriminatory, um, and, um, and somehow we as a society install a trust in these artists that they will not abuse the, this possibility that they are being handed, right? They're not going to abuse the fisherman that sits next to the scientist, that next, sits next to the architect, sits next to the... But they weave something out of these informations that then provide an experience that we can share with an audience that uh, then has an experience itself and build their own kind of uh, um, uh, opinions out of that. We have found this to be an incredibly, incredibly powerful uh, method. Uh, and, uh, and because of that, we've decided to uh, not be itinerant anymore, not be acting all around the globe, but actually find an embassy for this, uh, which is Ocean Space, as, which was, as was mentioned, which we opened earlier this year uh, in March with a work, a long-term research 
commission done by John Jonas in collaboration with uh, Dr. David Gruber, who is a marine biologist. It's the first time that Joan in her long career, uh, even with 13 years practicing at MIT, <coughs> is collaborating with a scientist. But, um, but it was necessary for us to A, create a space that sits outside and is open to the public and a space where the public can encounter these kind of practices, but these concerns, they can encounter the people that work in this space, because as we know here, it is hardly possible as civil to society to enter into this space. And, uh, and uh, yeah, here we go, the sexy scrolling of a PDF. Um, <laughs> live on screen um, uh, where was I yes Venice uh, so ocean space Venice uh, opened as as a place of encounter as an embassy for the oceans a space to give the ocean a voice and make sure that it's being heard and uh, uh, and with that and being completely confused by the scrolling of sorry, the PDF, sorry, sorry. I'm going to leave it and hand it over <laughs> to you. Well, I just wanted right. to show them the picture of the, the International Thank Seabed you. Authority that you were talking about. Thank ah. you, Marcus. These are, all, these are all images from the project that uh, they commissioned with Armin Linke of the International Seabed Authority. And do you want to, wait, 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 the cables are? Yes, sir. Because it's, they're such good images. Sorry, I didn't mean to confuse you. <laughs> yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, Not yet, but you're going to come, yes. Okay, yeah, for the benefit of time. Thank you. Oh, we are on the wrong slide. Um, do we have it? Let's go all the way back. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Thank you so much to Catalina and to Instituto de Empresa for uh, hosting us and, and organizing this. And big thanks to TBA21, to Francesca and to Marcus for, for inviting me to join you this morning to talk about something that's okay, uh, that is very important to all of us, I'm sure. Uh, and if I had to convince you of something this morning, I think it would be basically that we're not going to get out of this huge crisis. We're, gonna, we're not going to find paths ahead. Of course, without scientific and technological innovation, of course, without political will, of course, without social innovation, but also a very key role for cultural innovation. And cultural innovation, which is the capacity to tell new stories, to create new images, and to make questions from different places is something that artists today and artist researchers and artistic research is pushing very much in the center. And I want to talk a little bit about that. This is an image that Francesca has already mentioned before, four years ago. Uh, Olaf Aurelioson, Icelandic uh, artist uh, in Paris during the COP21 summit, uh, brought this huge chunk of ice from a melting glacier in the Arctic uh, to the center of Paris. And the, to me, the idea here was uh, taking this image of the uh, polar bear in the farthest regions that we've always used and bring not the elephant in the room, but literally like the polar bear in the room, uh, so you could rub your face against it. So take this thing that belongs to an iconography, but also to a very distant space to which we know we are connected, but which in the end we never ever get to see, and, and rub your face against it too. Again, this is the elephant in the room. This is the huge thing we don't want to talk about as we go in our daily lives from one place to another. And it really caught my attention and struck it when this year, the. Uh, amazing people from Extinction Rebellion brought out this uh, huge pink boat, which is the elephant in the room again, uh, to the center of London uh, with this big saying, tell the truth, which is the number one of their claims. We all know what the truth is. Uh, half a million people was yesterday uh, on the streets of this city demanding uh, the people here in this place right now uh, in negotiating rooms in the working groups to tell everybody what the truth is. And to do that, we use the power of images, interventions, and stories. And I think this is something that we need and that we're going to need further in the years ahead as we are approaching the huge transformation that we have to face. Uh, if any of you went to Venice this year, to the uh, Venice Pavilion, 
if it's clicking, I, I don't know if it's clicking. Mm. You probably saw, we're trying to use our technology, which is not a technology we use normally as much as we can. It is a video, ah, now go. it's playing. This was the uh, winning pavilion at the Venice Biennale this year, uh, a piece which is actually an opera in the Latvian pa pavilion. And what this piece is about is about all of us. It's a day on the beach where there is something that everybody is aware of but sort of wants to avoid. Uh, this has been a very successful and very impactful project because it tells or it found ways of speaking about the things that we don't want to speak about, about this nagging uncomfortable sensation in the back of our head that we keep carrying it with us every single moment of the day or that we should have. The idea that time is running out, that major transformations need to happen. Uh, but if the languages of media, the languages of politics don't carry out that idea very well, there's other people that is finding new devices, new methodologies and new mechanisms to carry this idea. We are all these people on the beach taking the sun as we are trying to avoid the uncomfortable topics of conversation, which is that time is running out, which is that things are not normal or how they used to be. Uh, I really honestly feel that we need philosophers as much as we need scientists. We need philosophers to coin the kind of notions and ideas that will give us the vocabulary to speak about that. Uh, this is Timothy Morton, I think one of the key philosophers today to speak about this idea. He coined this notion, a hyper object. Hyper objects are things that uh, move at a pace and on a scale that don't adjust very well to our senses. So the idea of, the, of an hyper object is that some things are too big and too close from us to see them properly. And that is actually what the feeling of dealing with the planetary crisis is. Because we are stuck to its on its face, we cannot see its limits, we don't know exactly where it starts and where it ends, it's nowhere in particular but it's a million tiny things at the same time. And I think artists today are making an essential work cataloging the many places, the many signals that we can find where this is happening, where this is going on. Um, this is uh, Bernie Krauser, one of the big artists making a catalog of sounds, of the sound landscapes that we're losing, the soundscapes, recording forests, recording mountains, and seeing how the sound of a forest in 2005 and the sound of a forest in 2019 is completely different. The silence is creeping in. We know that the world is changing fast enough to be able to have a catalog of recordings that tell us that there is a whole world that is disappearing before of our eyes, or more literally of our ears as we are recording places that are disappearing. Uh, this is part of a process that Bruno Latour, of course, one of the most important philosophers and sociologists of science today is calling the mutation. The recognition that we are not living today in the same planet that our grandparents were born in. That in a way we are like the astronauts in Planet of the Apes who left to explore a different planet, crashing a new alien world just only to discover that it's the same world from which we departed. But we just changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere, changed the course of the rivers, changed the acidity of the oceans, basically transforming it in a radically different planet to the one we took off. So, for instance, this is the work of artist Kelly Jasvag working with geologist Charles J. Moore, cataloging one new mineral that is appearing all throughout the world, arising in beaches in the world. They call it plastic glomerates, and it's actually a, a, a new mineral made of the most common artificial mineral in the world, plastic, that is melting and is actually colliding and mingling with natural sediments, with sand and rock, to create something that is as human and is natural, and that is actually reshaping, as we all know, the very same material fabric of the world in which we are living. Uh, artist Tomas Araceno, which Francisca has also mentioned, is cataloging the clouds that are changing. We are losing kinds of clouds and we are producing new kinds of clouds as we keep on releasing emissions in the atmosphere. In his uh, Emerging Cloudscape project, he is basically telling us our children, our grandchildren, will have a different landscape of clouds than the ones our grandfathers has. This is all the ways in which artists are cataloging the mutation that Bruno Latour talks about. And artists like Charles Lim in Singapore is also representing radically the conflict between capital and, and the planet and nature in different ways. In Singapore, 25% of the surface is already surface that has been reclaimed to the sea. Singapore is the number one buyer of sand in the world, the second most traded community after, a commodity after water. But Singapore is also on the equator, which is where sea level rises for, of course, 
through it in, in a harder way. So the history of this tiny country is the history of a battle against the sea, as they are trying to reclaim putting more and more sand into the sea, uh, but also protect themselves from the unavoidable reality that the sea is reclaiming everything that is taken, that we took from it. Uh, studio Folder, an Italian research studio, is doing an incredible work, piece of work, it really opened up your mind to the kinds of things that are happening in the Alps, in the border between uh, Italy and Austria. Uh, they set a sensor of a sensor network, a network of sensors and GPSs, basically to catalog how, with the melting of the glacier in the border, the same shape of the border between these two countries is changing. It's moving, so you can tell that the border between it uh, Italy and Austria today is metamorphosing as the shape of the glacier and the snow is also changing. We are in a new reality that we have to negotiate where the limits between the countries is retaking place. So we need to think about new devices and new methodologies to tell our stories that make us understand which is the world in which living is. This is a project that we did a year and a half ago with Superflux, uh, a speculative design studio called Mitigation of Shock. Uh, it's a whole apartment. It's actually a full apartment as a story. It's a world that you enter and then uh, you find yourself in the world of 2050 where extreme weather events um, have produced a uh, crisis in food security. So you have not take for granted anymore that you can go around the corner and buy a tomato wherever you are in the world because that's the world we headed in. In this project, we built up a few apartment telling the stories of a world of planetary crisis, which is the world in which we may find ourselves in 30 years, but also creating these operative, real, self-sustaining farms using fog ponies, which is a variety of aquaponics, to grow your own food and to, to increase a little bit your network of food security. And the farm was real, the endeavor was also real. We were trying to work with that very carefully. I'm going to try to speed ahead a little bit. Donald Haraway, another of the key philosophers of our time, uh, tells us that we need to think of a world where we become with, we become with the other species, the other forms of life that we're sharing with this planet. We basically know that there is no way out of the planetary crisis where we don't think about interdependence. The fact that we are, as humans, not an autonomous species, but that without the insects in the uh, ecosystems, without the bees, without the bacteria in our stomachs, there is no future for us. We depend on those species the same that they depend from us. So the wall of interdependence, the wall in which we realize that we uh, need to create a paradigm of a world where non-humans have a voice in the same presence as humans, is something that artists today are looking in many ways. Uh, this is Win Win, a theater piece for humans and jellyfish that we stage, and that actually you can see now in London, in the Royal Academy, in Singapore, at the Art Science Museum, and also in Germany, in Essen, uh, is a story about how the world seen from the perspective of jellyfish, which are one of the winning species with climate change because their predators are disappearing, because the change in temperature in the oceans may benefit them and make them thrive. The world looks very different from the perspective of jellyfish. Or from the perspective of the oldest things in the world, cataloged by photographer Rachel Sassman, who has been taking pictures to columns of organisms that exist um, for many, many years. Uh, I'm going to finish with a project by Daisy Ginsberg, an artist working with synthetic biology who will be joining us at the Thyssen on Tuesday in another of activities in the cultural program. Uh, in this project, Resurrecting the Sublime, Daisy has worked with synthetic biologists, uh, Christina Agapakis and her company Ginkgo, to find one species of tree that disappeared in Hawaii in 1916, uh, one of these many species that we're losing with the sixth extinction to try to reconstruct through uh, synthetic biology the smell of the flower of that tree that none of us will be able to smell and have been able to smell, of course, uh, because it's been a century since that tree disappeared. Uh, this is a symbol of the utopian but also needed work of reparation that we need to uh, understand. In a, in, a, in a world, in a hurt world, in a world that is hurting, we can and we may need to think in terms of reparation, of how can we fix some of the uh, uh, evil that we have mended. Uh, I want to finish with a couple of things. Uh, Bruno Latour says literally that the thing that unites all humans today in the world is the feeling that we're losing the ground beneath our feet. That literally the ground, I mean, everything that seems stable and that seems sure is disappearing. Uh, and that we are headed towards new territories, and how these new territories 
uh, will be need to be reclaimed and invaded. We know that whatever happens in the second part of the 21st century, whether we meet the uh, goals of the Paris Agreement or we don't, will be radically different to what we came before. There is no chance that we will keep on living the way that we live. Uh, and we want to tell the story of how artists, uh, as cultural researchers and artistic researchers, are allowing us to imagine and to prototype those new territories that we have. So, thank you. Uh, well, th thank you very much for sure. these wonderful presentations. I yeah. think uh, we have been able to see how this is a very complex topic that definitely the art scene can bring a lot to the table when tackling this issue. We've seen very, uh, three very different perspectives. And um, maybe we have time for a couple of questions very quickly. Um, in, the first one would be for Francesca. I mean, you've definitely been a leader in this field and really being the trigger and the, the support so that all these projects uh, you know, come along and, and they're happening. Uh, what do you think is the responsibility of, of our patronage in this field, you know, when facing environmental issues? Well, it's a very personal choice, of course, but I'm seeing more and more, interestingly enough, and I don't want to be too much of a feminist here, but quite a few women collectors are picking up this baton, or have picked up this baton, like Maya Hoffman, for instance, who has a whole institution of, create, mm -hmm. of innovation and in design. Art. I mean, in, in Al, it's incredible. And, um, and I think that more of us are feeling that it's very, very difficult for museums and other institutions to, to support these type, or, or commissioning in general, the importance of creating new works that go beyond the art market. Because the art market is churning out these things and we, we also have another conversation about the future of the art market. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that being able to fulfill certain artists' dreams and being able to facilitate projects that otherwise would have no place in our world that make possible the to render to the public something that goes beyond being decorative or illustrative, that goes and tells an important story, but still using all of the qualities of the arts. And I think, Marcus, you hit on the nail on the head when you talked about trust. Because commissioning, you need to trust an artist, you need to, they need to trust you, and the whole process, which can last from six months to six years is based on trust. And therefore, when a visitor comes to see the place, they, the piece, they can trust it. That image of the black Western flag, people are trusting and I see them standing in front of it going, this says it all. You know, you don't have to, I don't need to stand next to there and talk to everybody that comes to stand in front of it and explain it because the piece speaks for itself. Yeah, and I think powerful. those are the powerful images that represent things that are either too big, too explosive, or too remote for us to be able to even comprehend. And I think this is something that I feel is really our responsibility. And since more and more artists are stepping up to the table doing amazing field work, huge amount of research. I mean, there's one sitting there Jeremy McCain, one of our great friends, is an incredible artist and innovator and scientist and activist and mover and shaker, you know. And I think these are the kind of people that really deserve the support that we want to give them. Perfect. Thanks so much. Sorry. Francesca. Short. Uh, maybe a little question for Marcus. Um, you've tackled upon this, but maybe you want to dig in a bit deeper. Um, what interdisciplinarity brings to the table when tackling such a complex issue as, um, as climate change? Well, I think, I think the big challenge is for us as individuals, how do we register it, right? Um, because it's such a slow moving, slowly changing dramatic shift in a planetary system that at any point in time with our limited sensor sensory system that we have we feel weather right that's what it's warmer or it's colder it's windier it's stormier we have floods or not floods right this is what we register we don't register the plastic we don't register the carbon we don't so to bring all of these people around the table to to have a conversation between um, a, a paleogeologist that can talk through 
millions of years mm -hmm. with uh, architects and urbanists that can think spaces in a completely different way to then think about an international legal person that can say, listen, we actually need policy that works with the earth system, not with national fictional boundaries that we're, that we're drawing. And then, uh, you know, a lawyer that says, listen, and we need to rethink the way that we take responsibility and ownership of the people that produce or take a mineral out of the, out of the ground. And then we kind of uh, uh, turn the responsibility over to the end user Right? to say now you have to take care of it, that it gets disposed in a certain way. And uh, so, then, so all of these things are so complex, they're so vast and so uh, uh, incredibly, incredibly entangled that it is impossible for any one single discipline to, to be able to find a common ground, to think through all of these. Um, and then we come to these spaces here, right? Where we are supposed to talk about environment and we're supposed to talk about the changing environment and we're in a completely climate controlled room. We don't even know where we are. We could be, we could be, we could be in Santiago, who knows, right? <laughs> we're not, I, I don't think we are. The last I know, I, last night you I know, in Madrid I arrived morning. in Madrid. <laughs> but it's absurd, it is absurd that we are in complete comfort, completely hydrated, finally out of glass bottles, not yes. plastic bottles, congratulations <laughs> yes. Spain, um, caffeinated, all of that, everything is fine and we're supposed to take the urgent decisions that we need. So we should be outside or we should have an artist design this space as an experience because they're experts in shifting your kind of, your personal experience when you enter a space, right? So how can we put, be put in a situation where we actually think about and feel the urgency to take the decisions that we need to take, mm. right? And that we need to do together, we cannot do alone. And that's the, also that it's, it's very difficult, right? That people on the street say the politicians have to do it and then we end climate change. It's not gonna end. Processes are in motion that are not irreversible and we need to live with them. We're not going to stop them, right? We need to live with them. And that needs a completely different kind of imaginary than the one that we're being told right now. Yeah, I think that's Thank you, very eloquent. <laughs> and I think maybe we can take the very last one uh, for Jose Luis. Uh, Jose Luis, what can artists contribute to how society perceives the scale of this problem and the scope of the transformation it requires? And I think we'll finish with that. So I, I think Francesca said it super succinctly, and that was very good. Like, like the role of an artist is not being either illustrative or decorative. It's not about being the biggest culture made of plastic bottles in the shape of, of a fish, or it's not just making a picture of what is going on in some corner of the world. Uh, actually, artist Memo Atkin, a friend yesterday or two days ago, said on Twitter something that I really like. He said like, that the job of the artist is not to change the world, it's to change people. And I think that's very important because, of course, artists cannot solve anything on their own, but they can be agents making questions that are not coming from any other vantage point. An artist is a researcher, same as a scientific researcher, same as a social researcher. He just uses a different methodology and then poses different questions. And I think that, as I was saying right now, that the the world right now, like in the last two weeks, has this wave of feminist new uh, forms of protest in the street because a performance group started staging a new way of talking about uh, violence against women, right? It's like, I don't feel like I have to say a lot more when you see performance art that usually is mock, you know, or parodied, actually being able to take millions or thousands of women all over the streets of all over the world to denounce uh, violence against women. This is, I think, one of the many, many ways in which you see how we will need these new images, we will need these new places from which to position and against. Uh, in the end, I think art many times is applied philosophy, you know? It's philosophy made into something that is tangible, that is happening through our senses. And we do not only need the people that we tell us this is the objective reality that we've been able to measure through our instruments, through our models, but the people that we say living under these conditions will mean this form of change, this form of change, and this way of thinking in another way. Because also, there's nothing unavoidable about the way that we live. This is one of the things that, like almost everything that we do is 
contingent. It's not necessarily like it's been different in another way. I always put about the same example because to me it's incredible. Something as natural that we take for granted about the fact that we go to bed every night and then we sleep for seven or eight hours and then we keep up. It wasn't always like that. There was a time where people were sleeping one chunk, then they, they woke up, they read, they sleep, they had sex, and they would sleep for a couple of hours more. So if, if we've even changed that, imagine absolutely every aspect of our lives that we could change. And I think this is one of the uh, things that we need. People making the question and presenting the hypothesis that tell us what if. I, I think culture is the laboratory of society. It's one of the places where we rehearse other models and other ways of living. And I think that's why we need it. Yeah, I agree. Great, yeah. thank you so much. Um, I would like to, to thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, you cannot imagine how happy we are and how proud we are that first art was in the agenda, you know, of COP25 in the blue zone. Yeah. Thank you very much for the Spanish government to really host us. I'm so proud to be, you know, co-hosting this panel, IE University, together with TVA21. Um, I think we could have better partners for this topic. Uh, Francesca is really doing an amazing leadership on, on this field, and I think you're being really an example and a leader on how to put um, this, this, uh, you know, challenging topic into the agenda. Um, in, the, in the best, with the best means possible and with the, the highest standards uh, possible. So thank you very much and we hope this is the first our panel of many in the future, in future COPs. And yes. thank you so much all for being here today. No, no, it's really let's a pleasure. have really good art here. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, can no, no. I invite you all to come to the Thyssen Museum? You all have a... I think you've got a little pamphlet on your yeah, seat. Yeah, on your chairs. But please do. It's right... Uh, Paseo del Prado. Um, I brought a few here in case some of you didn't get them. But do go and see this work because it's really monumental. Um, it is what it is. It's quite an amazing work and I'd love to see you there. It's free. You just walk in off the streets and you can see him. Thanks so much. Yeah. On Tuesday. We'll see again on Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. 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 Oh, and on Tuesday, sorry, on Tuesday we will have a panel uh, again mm -hmm. with the three of us, but a couple of other people uh, and artists uh, that you've been showing in the auditorium of the Thyssen Museum mm -hmm. at 7.30. Yeah. So we'd be very happy to see all of you there too. Thank you. And we promise not to say the same thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs>